Dear students, I welcome all of you to this discussion module of Dermatology. So in this particular discussion module, we have basically three important categories of discussion. So first we will be discussing the AIMS June 2020 questions, followed by how do we approach Dermatology as a student, as a PG aspirant, what are the important topics and how exactly we should approach these topics. And thirdly, there will be some concluding remarks to end the discussion. So let's begin discussing the dermatology questions which appeared in the AIMS June 2020 exam. So let's begin with question number one. The antifungal with anti-inflammatory and anti-pruritic actions. And these were the options in the exam. Number one, ketoconazole. Number two, laliconazole. Number three, terbinafin. And number four, sertoconazole. So out of these four given options, the correct answer was sertoconazole. Now let us see what is special about sertoconazole. Now we know that whenever there is a drug ending with the word azole, it must be belonging to the azole group of drugs and azole group of drugs are antifungal in nature. Now in addition to the regular properties of an azole, sertoconazole has got extra properties in the form of anti-inflammatory properties. So sertoconazole is anti-inflammatory because it inhibits cytokine release and at a higher concentration, sertoconazole can also be fungicidal in nature. And the third important point to remember here is chemically sertoconazole is made up of benzothiophene ring and because of this benzothiophene ring the drug is lipophilic and hence it is retained within the skin for a longer duration. So that's important to remember. Now moving on to the important topical antifungals and how do they work in dermatology. So this is very important and important diagram to remember because we know that as a basic point that ergosterol is the main content of the fungal cell membrane. So the fungal cell membrane has ergosterol as the main content. So in the synthesis of ergosterol, different steps happen. So the first step is squalene is converted to lanosterol by squalene epoxidase. And there's a very important group of drugs which is going to inhibit this squalene epoxidase, which we call as allylamines. And the example for allylamines is terbinafine, a very important drug. Lanosterol is converted to carbon-14 D-methyl lanosterol by yet another important exam called as 14-alpha D-methylase. So this was the question of NEAT 2019. The drugs which inhibit 14-alpha D-methylase are the azole group of drugs. And further in pharmacology, we divide azoles further into based on the number of nitrogen atoms within the ring. So if we have two nitrogen atoms, we call them as imidazoles. So if there are two nitrogen atoms, we call them as imidazoles and if there are three nitrogen atoms, we are going to call them as triazoles. So imidazoles and triazoles are the broad classifications for azole group of drugs. Further, carbon-14 D-methyl lanosterol is going to be converted to fecosterol by carbon-14 reductase. Fecosterol further is converted to episterol by delta-87 isomerase. So these two important enzymes can sequentially be blocked by yet another group of drugs which are termed as morpholines and the best example for a morpholine is amorolfin. So amorolfin is a drug which we regularly use in clinical practice in onychomycosis which is fungal infection of the nail and in onychomycosis as it was asked in NEAT 2020 as well the formulation that we use we call it as a nail lacquer. So the formulation is called as nail lacquer. So apart from these drugs that we use generally in dermatology, there's yet another important antifungal which works a little different, which we need to remember is cycloperoxolamin. So cycloperoxolamin is a broad spectrum antifungal drug and it has a very unique mechanism of action. So how does this drug work is, it is going to chelate the metal trivalent cations. So the different cations in the form of Fe3 plus and Al3 plus are chelated. So once these ions are chelated, what is going to happen? The metal dependent enzymes get inhibited in the form of cytochromes and catalases. And we know that these metal dependent enzymes are very, very important for cell activity. With the inhibition of these enzymes, the cellular activities get disrupted and it alters the membrane permeability as well. We move on to the next question. Aplasia cutis is produced by which of the following? Number one, carbamazole. Number two, levothyroxine. Number three, hydroxyurea. And number four, propyl thioracin, right? This is more of an OBG kind of a question. The correct answer for this question was 
carbimazole. Now, why carbimazole is the answer? Because it produces aplasia cutis. What is aplasia cutis? As we can see in the image here, it is basically congenital absence of skin. So, congenital absence of skin is called aplasia cutis. This is a straightforward question. We go to the question number three. A person was on anti-cancer drug for the last 14 days. He developed an itchy rash on the back as given in the image. Which of the following is implicated in the causation? And these were the options. Number one, bleomycin. Number two, doxorubicin. Number three, actinomycin. And number four, mitomycin. So out of the given drugs, what we need to identify is what is this condition? So we see here, if you carefully see, you can see multiple linear streaks over the back. So you see these linear streaks over the back. So first to make a diagnosis, this condition is called flagellate dermatitis, right? This condition is called flagellate dermatitis. And the most important drug, which is going to result in the development of flagellate dermatitis is bleomycin. So flagellate dermatitis, which is produced by bleomycin. So why does bleomycin produce flagellate dermatitis? Let us try to understand this point. For this, we need to remember the metabolism of bleomycin. So normally bleomycin is inactivated in the body by an enzyme called as hydrolase. So hydrolase usually inactivates bleomycin. However, there are two important tissues in the bodies which are physiologically deficient in this particular hydrolase enzyme. Number one is skin and number two is lungs. So I've already told you, in skin, we have flagellate dermatitis as a side effect. And this is one of the more popular questions which you get in pharmacology as well. The important side effect of bleomycin in lung is pulmonary fibrosis. So very, very important is pulmonary fibrosis. Now we understand the mechanism as to why Bleomycin produces cutaneous and pulmonary side effects. This is because of the lack of hydrolase. So how does flagellate dermatitis present? We need to remember what is the meaning of the word flagellate. So flagellate is nothing but whip-like. So flagellate is nothing but whip-like. So you get these whip-like lesions which are extremely pruritic in nature. So this basically is a type of eruption which is going to present as a diffuse pruritic flagellate lesions. The distribution is important dermatology usually involves the trunks and occasionally the extremities as well. And then these lesions are going to heal with hyperpigmentation. So that is another point we need to remember. Another important cutaneous side effect which can be produced by chemotherapy drugs which you need to remember here is serpentine supravenous hyperpigmentation. So it looks something like this. So what is this condition? This is usually produced by adverse effect of IV chemotherapy drugs. So when we give intravenous chemotherapy drugs, many a times what happens, these drugs during the infusion can damage the endothelium of the blood vessels. This is mechanism number one. Mechanism number two is it can produce subclinical thrombophlebitis. So the important drugs in chemotherapy which can produce this include number one, 5-fluorouracil followed by doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, docetaxel and bleomycin. So this is the important list of the drugs producing serpentine supravenous hyperpigmentation. Now how does it present? It basically presents as a linear streak of hyperpigmentation which will be above the venous architecture. We can trace it along the vein. So once you administer an IV chemotherapy agent, you're going to have cutaneous hyperpigmentation which is going to be along the course of the vein. This is very easy to identify as well. So two important side effects to remember. Number one, flagellate dermatitis and number two is serpentine supravenous hyperpigmentation. We go to question number four, which was a first timer names. Methyl isothiazolinone or MI as it is abbreviated in cosmetics is number one, is it a surfactant? Number two, humectant? Number three, emulsifier or number four, preservative. So out of the four options, the correct answer for methyl isothiazolinone is this drug is a preservate. Very, very important component of cosmetics is methyl isothiazolinone. So what exactly is this? As I've already told you, it's a preservative. And why is it important in cosmetics? Because what we use in our day-to-day -day schedule, for example, we may be using shampoos, conditioners, sunscreens or any kind of baby lotions. Most of them have methyl isothiazolinone. So this is an important component. So why is it included in cosmetics? It is included because this particular agent is going to inhibit bacterial growth. So it inhibits bacterial growth in cosmetic products. So that is why it is very important to remember this particular compound. Moving on to the next question. So this was the image-based question in AIMS. 
we showed a picture of a girl child actually with hypopigmented patches and crusts. So we don't have the exact picture which was asked in the exam. So it was resembling something like this boy's picture. So here you can see multiple hypopigmented crust lesions over the face with a bizarre kind of a distribution. And here these were the options in the exam, dermatitis artifacta, polymorphic light eruption, contact dermatitis to henna and vitiligo. So out of these options, the best one which fits the given condition with a female child with bizarre kind of a pattern as it was asked in the exam is dermatitis artifacta. So let us see what are the important points which we need to keep in mind to diagnose dermatitis artifacta. So first what point what we need to remember here is it's a psychocutaneous disease. So there are a lot of diseases which have an overlap between dermatology and psychiatry as it is related to the mind. And what does a patient do in this particular condition is the skin lesions here are self-inflicted. So the patient himself is going to inflict injury. So when a patient inflicts injury, as you can see in this image, you can see some hypopigmented lesions and what we see is crusted lesions as well. So when we look at this background, these are basically the bizarre lesions, bizarre kind of a lesions which you get over the face. And the next point to remember here is where will be the distribution of the lesions. So in dermatology, very, very important to remember the distribution. The distribution is going to be on the accessible body parts. So when a person is trying to harm himself, he's going to harm himself on those parts where it is easily accessible. So the accessible body parts like probably the limbs and the face are the more commoner sites for dermatitis artifacta. So what are the other indicators of this particular disease? in history or in real time when we see in a patient. So when we take history from such patients, what is going to happen? We are going to find a very important term which is known as hollow history. What do you mean by hollow history? Usually when we ask history in dermatology, we usually ask the patient about the evolution of the lesions. That means I want to know how did the lesion initially start? How did it progress? In these patients, if I ask history, the patient will not be able to give you the entire details of the course of the evolution. So the patient will say, I just noticed it, it was like this. He is not going to tell you like what exactly happened, then what modified the lesions. He is not going to give you any history. So this is number one, hollow history. Number two is uh, important expression, which is termed as Mona Lisa smile. So what is Mona Lisa smile? Mona Lisa smile is basically the indifferent attitude. So the indifferent attitude, which is displayed by the patient is called Mona Lisa smile. That means, see, when I have such kind of bizarre looking, ugly looking and terrifying skin lesions, I'm supposed to be a little aware, isn't it? And I'm supposed to be a little conscious about it. I'm likely to be more scared and worried about these lesions. But you will see a patient of dermatitis artifact is hardly bothered about it, right? He shows that it is not going to make a big difference to him. That indifferent attitude portrays a smile on the patient's face, which is termed as Mona Lisa smile. The next important thing is, you look at the morphology, you will have a bizarre and a variety kind of lesions. We can have ulcers, you can have crusted lesions, you can have erosions, you can have necrosis. So a variety of spectrum of diseases can be seen in association with dermatitis artifacta. We take up the question number six. A male patient presented with history of fever and joint pain. Following the intake of NSAIDs, five days later, he develops hyperpigmentation on the nose. What is your diagnosis? And these were the options in the exam. Number one, melasma. Number two, FDE, that is fixed drug eruption. Number three, chikungunya fever. And number four, dengue. So what we need to remember about this question is, please understand this was the fourth time in the exam that this question has got repeated. At the first time it got repeated, there was an associated image and afterwards image has not been shown. So this is very, very important repeat question in AIMS exam. And the correct answer for this question is, chikungunya fever. So chikungunya fever is the answer for this question. So in association with chikungunya fever, what are the points that we need to remember? So presenting feature of chikungunya fever, whenever it presents in the dermatological aspect, we need to remember that 40 to 75 percentage of the patients can have a skin rash. And when we look at this skin rash, it usually the onset of the disease is on day three. And the patient is going to have a macular or a maculopapular eruption and usually the distribution is going to be mainly on the limbs and the at times it can be on the trunk as well. So limbs and trunk are the two important sites where we look for this macular or a maculopapular eruption. So this is the one kind of an example which you get. And later on what can happen is a very important sign in dermatology which is called chick sign. 
So this tick sign was basically reported in the state of Kerala where uh, Dr. Riyas, who was also my examiner for postgraduate examination, so madam basically reported this uh, sign in association with chikungunya fever. When she happened to see a lot of cases of chikungunya, when there was an epidemic of chikungunya in Calicut. So during this phase, she has observed that many people started developing pigmentation on the nose. So here you can see this pigmentation on the nose. So what we had to understand is the melasma like pigmentation over the nose. The melasma like pigmentation over the nose seen in a patient of chikungunya fever is termed as chick sign. So that's very, very important. The history of joint pain and taking NSAIDs for it should not sway you to the diagnosis of a drug eruption. You need to understand the site is very, very important. Here it is going to be the melasma like pigmentation over the nose. So what exactly is melasma? We know that melasma is an acquired disorder. So we need to remember that it is acquired and usually it is seen in the age group of more than 40 years. Right? It is more commonly seen in women and look at the distribution of lesions. So the distribution of lesions is usually going to be on the symmetrical distribution over the malar area. It can involve the nose as well. Important thing is the age group and the size. So these are very, very important distinguishing factors for a melasma. And melasma usually takes some time to develop. It is a very, very slow process. It cannot be an acute process. Another important differential diagnosis for this condition is fixed drop eruption. So how do we identify a fixed drug eruption is this is a delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction. So it's delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction. So this is the first point we need to remember. And this usually happens to three important drugs. So what are the three important drugs which can produce it? You have cotrimoxazole, cotrimoxazole number one. Number two is NSAIDs. Third drug is tetracycline. So these are important drugs which can produce fixed drug eruption. So here what happens is the speciality of this drug eruption is whenever you get this drug eruption as you can see in the image here you get a well demarcated dusky red plaque. So the point to remember here is it presents as a well demarcated dusky red plaque. So it's a well demarcated dusky red plaque. And point number two is try to understand the meaning of this word. Why is it called fixed drug eruption? It's called fixed drug eruption because it recurs at the same site. Now once if I've got the lesion on any part of the body, next time I take the drug, again it is going to recur at the same site. That is another important property. It recurs at the same site on reintake. It recurs at the same site on reintake of the drug. And the most common sites which you get this particular drug eruption is mucosa. So one of the important points to distinguish this from chick sign is that FDE has a predilection for mucosa. Though it can be seen anywhere on the body. At your level what you have to remember here is that mucosa is an important site for a fixed drug eruption. What about dengue? Now dengue can present very characteristically with a biphasic rash. So what do you mean by biphasic rash is there are two phases. So in the initial phase of the first 24 to 48 hours, the patient can have a facial transient erythema. So why does it happen? This basically happens because of capillary dilatation. So because of the capillary dilatation, initially the patient can have a transient erythema which is seen on the face. And then what happens is after the onset of fever, three to six days later, patient will develop a maculopapular exanthem. And this basically happens as a immunological response to the virus. This happens because of the immunologic response to the virus. So the first rash is because of capillary dilatation. The second rash is because of immunological response to the virus. So both are very important for us to remember. And the characteristic appearance of the second rash is this. So what we need to identify here is you can identify that these are white islands. So these are the white islands and this is on a sea of red. So white islands in a sea of red is a very characteristic appearance of a dengue rash which you need to remember for the examinations. Move on to question number seven. So this is question number seven. A male child born to a non-consanguinous couple presents with a blister on the face associated with friction. 
So this history of similar presentation in a previous child who died two weeks after birth. What is the diagnosis? And these were the options. Neonatal pemphigus, congenital syphilis, epidermolysis bullosa and CBDC, that is chronic bullous dermatosis of childhood. So what we need to remember here is, see most of the students got this question wrong because they saw this word non-consanguinous. So sometimes in an MCQ exam, there could be some distractors. So when you see non-consanguinous, many students ruled out epidermolysis bullosa. So please understand, out of the whole question, what you need to grasp at your level is, whenever there is a blister at the site of friction, this is the most important word. Yes, I understand the ideal scenario would be the examiner asks you consanguineous couple because most of them are genetic disorders. However, when there is a blister at the site of friction, the immediate thing what should come to your mind is mechanobullous disease. Mechanobullous disease. So what are mechanobullous disorders? These are disorders where mechanical trauma induces blisters. Mechanical trauma induces blisters. So this is the scenario which you need to remember in case of an MCQ that whenever there is blister at the site of friction, that is the most important point in the MCQ. Immediately think about mechanobullous disease and out of the given option, the correct answer is going to be epidermolysis bullosa. So the correct answer is epidermolysis bullosa. And epidermolysis bullosa is broadly having three important types which you need to remember. Epidermolysis bullosa simplex, epidermolysis bullosa the junctional type and the third one is the dystrophic variant of EB. So this is basically a mechanobullous disorder, very very important. We need to also remember the different defects in these three types of epidermolysis bullosa. So in simplex the defect is going to be in keratin 5 and 14 and this keratin 5 and 14 is a part of the stratum bacillae. Junctional epidermolysis bullosa involves laminin protein and dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa involves collagen 7 and what you need to remember is collagen 7 is also a very important component of the anchoring fibrils. Anchoring fibrils which is a part of the dermoepidermal junction. So very very important just remember these three important antigens in EB simplex it is keratin 5 and 14. In junctional EB, it is going to be laminin and thirdly, in dystrophic EB, it is going to be collagen 7. Okay, so this is how CBDC presents. So you can see CBDC presents with multiple blisters which are arranged in a particular pattern. So first thing which should come to your mind when you are thinking about CBDC, chronic bullous disease of childhood is the speciality of this disease is it is IgA mediated number one. This is an example for an immunobullous disease and once there is a bullous disease, there must be a split in the skin, isn't it? And in this condition, the split in the skin is just below the epidermis. So you get a sub-epidermal split and this characteristic arrangement of lesions which are in an annular pattern is called as cluster of jewel, also referred to as string of pearl appearance. So this is very, very important for the exam to remember this point. So this is how a child with EB presents. So EB will present with multiple blisters and you can see this word friction associated blister. So whenever you handle the baby, this was previously our MCQs used to come, mother on handling the baby. So when you handle the baby at different sites of friction, you're going to have blisters. That is going to be the key point to diagnose epidermolysis bullosa. The next one to remember as a differential diagnosis is congenital syphilis. So how does congenital syphilis present? What you need to remember here is many students mark this also as an answer. You get vesiculobullous lesions. Number one, very important is you get vesiculobullous lesions. So congenital syphilis is going to present with fluid filled lesions and no other stage of syphilis presents with fluid filled lesions. This is the only stage in syphilis which can present with fluid filled lesions. That's why it's a very important differential diagnosis and that's why it's also called as syphilitic pemphigus. So this condition is also known as syphilitic pemphigus. Syphilitic pemphigus. Now, how do we identify this? So, the investigation of choice in a patient of congenital syphilis is the VDRL titer of an infant. So, very, very important. The VDRL titer in the infant should be four times more than the VDRL titer of the mother. 
So this is the investigation of choice. The investigation of choice is the VDRL content of the infant, the titer rather, should be four times more than the VDRL titer of the mother. So that is how you diagnose congenital syphilis. Going to question number eight. So this was an image based question in the exam showing dermal and subcutaneous infiltration of the skin. And what they mentioned here is traumatic inoculation. So traumatic inoculation is important. And this pattern is also very important. So you can see this pattern here. So both are important points which you need to remember. These were the options, porotrichosis, mycetoma, sarcoidosis and lupus vulgaris. So whenever you have a traumatic inoculation, you need to remember that it probably could be subcutaneous mycosis. It probably could be subcutaneous mycosis. Now why we should think about subcutaneous mycosis when there is trauma? There could be multiple diseases, but one another name of subcutaneous mycosis is it's also referred to as implantation mycosis. It's also referred to as implantation mycosis. That means these fungal infections have to enter the body through an external source. That's why they are termed as implantation mycosis. And here, so once you have diagnosed that it is a subcutaneous mycosis, you have to look at the pattern. And here you see the pattern which is in the form of a line like this, which in dermatology is termed as a linear pattern. So when I see a linear pattern, then I'm going to diagnose it as sporotrichosis. Very, very important for entrance exam is sporotrichosis. So let us learn a little more about this particular condition, sporotrichosis. Now sporotrichosis is also referred to as Rose and Gardner's disease. Sporotrichosis is also referred to as Rose and Gardner's disease. The causative organism of sporotrichosis is Sporotrix shenkai, right? Sporotrix shenkai, which is an example for a dimorphic fungus, right? The list of dimorphic fungus should be very, very clear to you. The, so many organisms are there, which is very, very important for micro as well. So this organism basically enters via a thorn prick. So once there is a thorn prick in a rose gardener, so once there is a thorn prick, the organism enters into the upper limb and basically what is it going to do? It is going to target the lymphatics. So once it is going to target the lymphatics of the upper extremity, via the lymphatics, the organism is going to spread and it is going to produce this linear lesions on the extremity. So the organism enters, it targets the lymphatics and starts moving upwards along the extremity, along the lymphatics. And this is a characteristic linear pattern for sporotrichosis, which is very, very important. Now, how are we supposed to diagnose a mycetoma? So which is also a subcutaneous mycosis. For mycetoma, you can see the whole tissue is swollen, isn't it? So this whole swollen tissue is termed as tumefaction. So this is termed as tumefaction. Tumefaction means tumor-like swelling. Tumefaction means tumor-like swelling. So this is point number one. So out of this tumor-like swelling, what is going to happen? You are going to get multiple discharging sinuses. So very important is number two, discharging sinuses. Discharging sinuses. And from the sinus, what is going to be discharging is you are going to have granules granules which are colonies of the microorganism, colonies of the microbe, right? We also know that mycetoma is broadly divided into actinomycetoma which is produced by bacteria and eumycetoma which is produced by fungal in etiology, right? So we have finished our first part where we have discussed the important questions which came in the AIMS June 2020 edition. Now let me tell you as a student how you should approach dermatology as a preparatory subject. So for entrance exam, why dermatology is an important subject? That's because point number one, it is a high scoring subject. So if you learn these limited things in dermatology, there's a good chance you will get most of the questions correct. And another irony about this is if there is a very difficult question in dermatology, there's a good chance that most of the students will get it wrong. So it is not going to be a competition between other students as well. So firstly, it is a high scoring subject. You cannot afford to miss an easy question in dermatology. That's point number one. Point number two, most of the questions in dermatology tend to be image based. Right? Predominantly they are image based. And here also I see a lot of students getting things wrong. That's why I'll be discussing how you should exactly approach a image based question in the exam. Thirdly, it is very easy to revise. So once it is easy to revise all these short subjects, skin, anesthesia, radiology, psychiatry, once you complete all these subjects, 
this is going to give you a sense of a feeling that you are going to finish more and more subjects faster so once you finish these subjects you psychologically feel that you have finished a lot of things and towards completion it gives you a psychological feeling which makes you feel better and then your number of subjects that you are completing becomes faster and faster so this is one of the subjects which is easy to revise and in a shorter duration you can do it dermatology one more important point is it links subjects for example in the second year mbbs it links microbiology right microbiology is extremely important for your exams and we see a lot of students having a issue with it because most of you don't go in depth and learn the subject the hardcore infections in microbiology lot of them are related to dermatology so when you read dermatology and microbiology together it is going to give you a lot of high yielding points and it's going to boost your score in the exam and uh, to become a better clinician right because apart from microbiology dermat also is linked to pediatrics to the topic of genodermatosis it is also related to internal medicine right to different different skin and systemic disorders finally most of us want to become a good clinician isn't it probably want to take up any uh, clinical subject we have to have basics in dermatology because whenever tomorrow you're going to see patients right many of them may have skin as a cutaneous manifestation presenting feature of so many different diseases right you want to become a pediatrician you may come across so many bacterial infections those patients may come to the pediatrician first right so you should have some basic knowledge as to what is happening in skin so that you give a comprehensive diagnosis to the patient that's why dermatology is very very important not only for entrance exam also in future for a practicing person now for the entrance exam per se how you should approach dermatology right so we have three important resources which are available you have videos once you do the videos the best way to consolidate the videos is to do the q bank so obviously the q bank will have lot of extra points so please remember q bank is basically a learning tool more than a testing tool so it is going to add a lot of extra points into it so which is going to be more high yielding for you and the third level is the subject wise test and the grand test right out of subject wise and grand test highest priority should be given to the grand test because it is very very important one common mistake we see that students make is like when you are going through the course of these 19 subjects many students make a mistake wherein they want to take the grand test only after completing the 19 subjects which could be very very risky because if you assume that you finish by september october and you start taking the grand test then it is too late because grand test will basically give you a minimal score out of which you have to improve after every grand test right the first score is obviously going to be disheartening right you cannot run away from the reality but the point that you finished mbbs you will be knowing something about each and every subject some basics you will be knowing so please don't make the mistake wherein you wait for the completion of all subjects be very very regular with grand test right so you will get a initial low score and with every month you will see that improvement is the one which you have to concentrate on rather than the score itself so your improvement is more in important for us where you can assess via the subsequent grand test scores now how you should approach the dermatology video so there are approximately 26 videos so if the time permits i would suggest all of you to watch the videos and uh, still if you are not able to do it because of lack of time uh, you can probably switch to the interns mode where the videos are sandwiched between some uh, q bank modules as well and whenever you are studying also i want you to basically focus on the high yield topics so the high yield topics is one which you should be focusing on so let me quickly go through the high yield topics in the exam for a dermatology uh, post graduate aspirant so the first topic has to be infections so we see lot of questions when i say infections there's usually 100% questions from bacterial one from bacteria one from virus one from fungus one from parasitic infections these are 100% sure in the exams right so combine it with micro and try to make your notes comprehensible in this particular topic and nowadays fungal infections are very important especially dermatophytosis right this is one topic which you should know in and out so the incidence of tinea and fungal infection is going up because most of the general practitioners also give steroids and mismanage the cases that's why it's become a huge problem in india that's why it's very very important that you focus on the micro part of it and pharmacology part of it as well very very important antifungals have been regular in the exam since the past 2 to 3 years STDs is yet another important topic and if you see NEET 2020 there were three questions from STDs three important questions the same topics of genital ulcer disease genital ulcer disease and the discharge disease components and the STDs in terms of syndromic management so genital ulcer disease genital discharge disease and 
syndromic management. These are the three topics you must know in and out. Right? Hansen's is very important. That's unique to dermatology. Usually, you can expect one question from here. Then the hardcore dermatology topics like papillosquamous diseases, bullous diseases, eczema, appendageal disorders, and pigmentary disorders. Right? So these are also some important topics which you need to remember. And uh, in relation to medicine, you should know skin and systems because usually you can have a question from acanthosis nigricans. And connective tissue diseases usually figure out in the form of Gottron's papules, Gottron's sign, heliotroprash, or probably a malar rash of SLE. And genodermatosis, the three important topics, neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis complex, and Sturz weber syndrome. So genodermatosis also is important. This is an overlap with pediatrics, right? So this is the crux of dermatology. The most of the topics are going to be from these important uh, subjects which I mentioned to you. So focus on these topics and go in depth of them very very important especially the std module is very very important now this is one thing which i want to highlight how to approach images so one trend if we have been noticing from me 2020 in comparison to previous one is probably the previous examiners used to use google images that's why what would happen is most of the students now tend to memorize an image that means you look at an image again and again you keep it in your mind and then if that image comes you get it right by memory but now what is happening is the examiners are using their personal uh, set of images. So they are seeing the images and they are using their personal images. So what is happening is those personal images are not telling with the images in your mind. That's why many students are getting image based questions wrong. So what we need to understand is how you should approach an image based question. It's very, very simple for the diagnosis. You approach it via morphology, configuration and distribution. So this should be the basics of any image. Whenever you look at an image, you look at the morphology, you look at the configuration and you look at the distribution. So always try to look at these points in the image rather than keep the whole image in your mind and memorize it. That will be a very problematic situation for you if new questions come next. So focus on morphology, configuration and distribution. When I say morphology, what do I mean? I mean when you look at an image, try to identify is it a primary lesion, is it a secondary lesion being shown or is it, is it a special lesion? So when I say primary lesion, you try to identify is it a macule, papule, plaque, nodule, pustule or are there any secondary changes? So is there some scaling, crusting, lichenification, these are some secondary lesion or try to see if it's a special lesion. So is it a comedone or is it a burrow or is it a target lesion? So all this I have covered in the initial modules in the video. So though these questions don't come in the exam, definitions will not be asked. You need to keep in mind the morphology of the lesions, right? Though the questions don't come, but for the diagnosis, you need to keep your basics strong. The primary, secondary, special lesion should be very, very clear in your mind. So once you've identified the morphology, look at the configuration, look at the arrangement. Two important examples if you have to give is, look at this arrangement. This is called as an annular arrangement. Look at the annular arrangement. This is called polycyclic. So if multiple annular lesions are there, if their margins fuse, they become polycyclic. So this is polycyclic lesions. So try to identify the configuration. Once you've identified the morphology and configuration, third important point is distribution. Try to see where are the lesions located. Are they on the flexures? Are they on the extensors? And do they have any special property? For example, are they along a nerve root? We call it as dermatoma. So if you go by these three simple points, morphology, configuration, distribution, for every picture, try to look at this. Don't memorize the picture in your mind. Look at the lesion and keep these three points in your mind. You'll be able to get almost every image-based question correct in the exam. And even if new questions come, using your common sense, you can easily eliminate the known factors and you will be left with the new question which you will get obviously correct in the exam, right? So to conclude, what I want to mention is we as faculty are with you. It's been trying times now, but you have to rise above the others and push yourself to do well in the exam. And for this, uh, if you are on social media, you can definitely use this platform, which is called Marolings, where we post a lot of questions. We post different kind of updates as well. For students who feel that social media does waste your time, that is true as well. So try to give an allocated time and there is one section which you can easily use, which is the FAQ section, the frequently asked questions. So here under this section, uh, the commonly asked doubts are already put there. So as a student, when you watch the videos, maybe you have some doubts. So you can directly go to this instead of posting it to a faculty, first to look at the section and see if these doubts have been addressed. So thus by being a silent spectator also, you can learn so many things. You can see, for example, this is an example from micro. You can already go through these questions and add it to your notes book. 
So summarizing this Facebook group, how is it going to help you is, it's going to give you the updates in the subject because things keep on changing. New drugs will keep on adding. So we'll try to give you the best updates in subject and you can clarify doubts that you have from the videos or from the QBank, you can clarify it. And there are controversies in every subject that we know, which you may, and it's very, very important that you go with a clear mind, right? Because in the exam, you once you have a clear mind, you're likely to do better in the exam. So clearing controversies is definitely going to give you the clear mind. And once the faculty says it and you believe it, obviously, so that gives you a clear picture and you will go confidently for the exam, right? So this is what I wanted to say. And uh, just to summarize, the last thing what I want to say is, yes, make a good plan. So once you plan well, like uh, for 15 days or 30 days, you make a good plan and that helps you to focus your energies there rather than not plan and take one day at a time. At least you must make a weekly plan or a fortnightly plan. Very important point. This is very, very important point. See that solving MCQs is a part of your schedule. You should be solving at least MCQs for 30 to 40 percent of the time of a day. Because it's an MCQ based exam, isn't it? Unless you have practice, in spite of knowing the theory portion, you may not be able to apply it in the exam. So see that, don't wait for all the videos to get over and solve questions. Please solve MCQs on a daily basis. Right, grand test is very, very important and I've already highlighted about that point. If there are volatile subjects, so many students have, I don't think there are volatile subjects, there are volatile facts in every subject. So if there is an option, you can obviously go for a group study which will help you to share your thoughts, right? And always sharing information, you're going to learn better because it's going to be a double revision for you as well. Stick to one source, right? So when you keep seeing the same thing repeatedly, it builds up a photographic memory in your mind. If you see the same thing through multiple sources and keep verifying it, finally nothing remains in your mind because it's not one subject. For faculties, it might be one subject. For you, it is 19 subjects. And for 19 subjects, remembering different, different points from different different sources is going to be impossible. So see that you keep looking at the same notes again and again, build up a good photographic memory and then when the time comes, you'll be able to localize it to your notes and easily get the questions correct from your past memory as well. Right? And see that in this scenario, be positive and surround yourself with positive people. Both are very, very important points which, which you need to remember. And the key to do well in exam is obviously going to be this point of sequential revision. So what I mean by sequential revision is another important mistake which is made by students. They wait for all the 19 subjects to get over and start revising. That's again going to be a disaster for you. So please plan a good revision. It can be either done at the end of three or four subjects or the best way to do it is every 15 days. Every 15 days, take a break and revise. Right? Revise sequentially so that after one month again you revise the whole thing. It becomes a good activity and that keeps reinforcing those uh, synapses in your brain, keeps reinforcing the memory so that you can remember it easily, right? And finally, one another important point that I gathered from most of the toppers this time, the toppers were the ones who enjoyed learning, right? There are many students who take it as a burden. Once you take it as a burden, it becomes very, very difficult for your brain to process this information. So always remember this point, enjoy this process. Because, as I always used to say in my class as well, like tomorrow, for instance, you take a pediatrics or medicine. You get it in a good college, right? And most of the students we see, you struggle answering the questions afterwards, right? That is because this is one option, right? Whichever college and whatever you've studied before doesn't matter. Now, these 19 subjects, if you learn them well, a lot of these points are asked when you're doing post-graduation as well. For your daily rounds, you would need so many of these points again. So if you have learned it well now, if you enjoy this process, you know that it is going to be useful for the future as well. For example, in one of the recent MD medicine exams, I was just looking at the paper, the main question was heme synthesis, right? Heme synthesis was the main question in that particular medicine paper, right? And in medicine, you're not going to read it. And this is where your biochemistry knowledge is going to help you. So that is why don't discard all your notes as well. Look at the subject which you've taken up, especially in medicine, you need almost all the notes books will be necessary. Even a subject like psychiatry and dermatology is a part of medicine where all these notes what you've taken is definitely going to help you in the future. So see that whatever you're learning now is not for this exam and it's over. It is going to be useful afterwards as well. So enjoy the process because as doctors, we have to learn every day and we have to keep ourselves updated. Right. So with this, I conclude my session by wishing all of you all the very best for the upcoming exams and good luck to all of you.